All right, so we are back with more of Rudolf Steiner's uh, very unusual history of Europe. And um, we're looking at a map here. This, this episode is rather epic, I think. Um, so it's going to require some maps uh, and some historical recapitulation. Um, so here we have the formation of the Frankish Empire under Charlemagne. Uh, he is crowned by Pope Leo in 800. Um, so he's the first emperor, uh, in a sense, of the far western civilization. Now notice here that the Arabs... Uh, have come up, the Umayyad Emirate, they have come across Spain, uh, or rather North Africa, and gone into Spain, which was Visigothic. Visigothic simply, simply means Western Gothic, as opposed to the Ostrogoths, the Eastern, the Eastern Goths. Um, and they have conquered the Visigoths uh, and set up the Umayyad Emirate. Remember that in 711 they were led by Tariq, uh, and um, who later reincarnates as Char Charles Darwin, as we have seen, um, in 711. And then they were stopped um, in 732 by Charles Martel, who then established, uh, they, they were stopped from crossing the Pyrenees there, who then established the Carolingian dynasty. And so Sh Charlemagne becomes his grandson. Um, the Umayyads were chased out by the Abbasids, by the way. The whole reason for their emigration across North Africa was because of political troubles uh, over the Caliphate and the Abbasids claimed uh, the rightful rule and chased out the Umayyads, which is why they went across North Africa and wound up into Spain. Fortunately, or I'm not sure <laughs> uh, what kind of a civilization we would have had because they brought all kinds of goodies with them. Uh, as I've said before, Aristotle and alchemy and algebra Arabic numerals, um, all kinds of great stuff uh, that fructified Western civilizations. Civilizations never just emerge by themselves. They're always uh, symbiotic in some way with other societies. Um, they then do eventually take on their own identity, like a nucleus that forms in a cell that has taken in other cells to perform specialized functions like mitochondria, let's say, or chloroplasts which are responsible for photosynthesis in larger cells. Our mitochondria have a different DNA in our cells and are responsible for oxygen respiration. So they have their special functions to perform. But nevertheless, there's a nucleus there with its own unique identity. And so, uh, so 732 Charles Martel uh, creates the Boundary Act and says, you shall go no further into this civilization. Otherwise, we would be an Islamic civilization. That would have been it for Christianity. So instead we get Charlemagne, who is crowned uh, by Pope Leo in 800, uh, and they claim uh, rulership over northern uh, Italy, Lombardy, in other words. Um, so this basically is the area that later becomes France. Um, but the problem with their claiming, let's look at some other maps here. Um, so here's uh, the same situation, and it's more clear here, the claim of the Franks, um, over Lombardy, northern Italy here. Um, but the problem is, um, once Charlemagne is crowned by Pope Leo, and he only did that because Pope Leo had been in danger of losing his life, so the, the Carolingians sent a special guard uh, to guard him. Charlemagne was a very pious man, and uh, so Leo owed him a favor, and, which is why he crowned him. Uh, but the real emperor uh, was Empress Irene, actually, uh, of the Byzantine Empire. She was an empress exactly contemporary with Charlemagne. She dies in 803, so three years after the coronation. But there's some controversy. This is what's left of the Byzantine Empire. Um, they once had all of southern Italy, what we would call the area of Naples, um, but they lost it. And so now they're only here at the tip. But there's some controversy because... Um, the West regards a female emperor as utterly ridiculous. Um, you cannot have a woman as an emperor, uh, but the East has a different opinion on this. Um, she is the official emperor. And it's interesting that the two civilizations, and they're totally different civilizations, um, didn't go to war uh, with each other over this issue, but they did not. Perhaps Charles did not feel quite strong enough to march against the Byzantines. 
but he probably would have won because they were already in a pretty weakened state uh, at that point. So then, of course, uh, the title of emperor goes down the drain with the death of Charles, um, and it devolves to his three grandsons here. Uh, we have here the division of his empire by the Treaty of Verdun in 843, with Charles the Bald inheriting most of France, Lothar over here, and Louis the German inheriting what will become mostly Germany eventually. Um, and then we have this issue of the Lotharingian Corridor, which the Germans and the French will fight over all the way down to the World Wars. Uh, so there's karma here that will last through the entire thousand year trajectory, thousand plus, 1200 years since Charles uh, Charlemagne, um, that, that will just keep going on and on, the wars between Germany and France, Germany and France, back and forth over possession of the Lotharingian corridor here. Um, so all of that is worth keeping in mind. Now, the Holy Roman Empire then, uh, this is the area that will become Germany. It, so it shifts to the east now, and um, it becomes, uh, Otto I in 961 is the first to revive the title of emperor. I am now the emperor, and he is crowned um, as emperor, and there's some controversy about this. Um, there's still the issue of Italy, and the Holy Roman Empire, which is mostly German, uh, claims ownership over these areas, Tuscany and Spoleto, uh, but not the Papal States. And so this, this is 962 now, so this gets revived. And then we fast forward down to uh, Henry III and Henry IV. Uh, and by the way, I made an embarrassing mistake. So we come back to our discussion of Pope Gregory VII, remember, who reincarnates as Ernst Haeckel in the 19th century. So we're coming back to that period. Uh, and I made the embarrassing mistake of, of confusing uh, Henry IV as the Holy Roman Emperor with the uh, English Henry IV that Shakespeare wrote about. <laughs> so I apologize for that mistake. Um, so what happens is that Henry III is a very, very powerful emperor. Um, and, the, and the papacy is in a very weakened state for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is immorality. The priests are taking mistresses. Uh, but there's a whole series of political reasons that have weakened um, the, papal, the papal states and they really need support. So they've got a very strong emperor here with Henry III, somewhere in the middle of the 11th century. Uh, let's, I don't think I wrote his dates down, but there's something like 1025-ish, uh, 1050, something like that. So, And he appoints actually five different popes. And these are later called anti-popes. There's only supposed to be one, but he appoints five of them. So he's a very powerful individual. All right, so um, this is the historical background to what uh, to the, the the three different lifetimes of two individuals now, um, and this is one of my favorite chapters so far in uh, in uh, Steiner's magnum opus. The uh, okay, so let's take a look here at Pliny the Younger. So rewind back to Pliny the Younger, six, 61 to 113 AD are his dates. Um, he's nothing major. He was a lawyer uh, and a magistrate, mostly a political figure. And all we have of him are his letters. He's not to be confused with his uncle, Pliny the Elder, the one who uh, laid a lot of the basis for natural science by collecting weird oddities and things, and uh, including weird knowledge and folk tales of weird fossils and all kinds of things. Uh, that's Pliny the, the Elder. All Pliny the Younger wrote were letters. And he wrote a bunch of letters to this guy, uh, Tacitus, who was a personal friend of his. Um, Tacitus's dates are 56 to 120 AD. Um, I've read Tacitus. He's magnificent. Tacitus, it should be remarked, is the first individual to ever write a word about the Germans in his short little treatise, Germania. I highly recommend it for its account of the primitive Germans at that time um, and German religion. And uh, But his main works are, of course, the Annals and the Histories, uh, which tell the, the histories, the Annals tell the history of the, the emperors, uh, starting with Augustus and going right on down. 
And it's an interesting, possibly karmic fact that Robert Graves, when he wrote I, Claudius, which became famous as a, an excellent PBS series, uh, pretty much used Tacitus as his primary source for the life of Claudius, who overlaps him by like two years. I think um, Tacitus was two years old when, when Claudius the emperor died. Um, so we have these two guys, Pliny the Younger and Tacitus. Uh, they're very good friends. Uh, Pliny looks up to Tacitus. Tacitus is clearly the, the more, has the larger intellect. Um, and uh, so now, they are reborn into this situation in the time of Pope Gregory the Seventh. Um, Tacitus is reborn as Matilda of Tusc Tuscany, and uh, Pliny the Younger first is reborn as her mother, Countess Beatrice, in the castle of Canassa in Tuscany. Um, so they have some political power. This woman does Beatrice and her daughter Matilda. Matilda is by far the more famous one. I couldn't even find a Wikipedia entry for Countess Beatrice. Um, and so uh, uh, Countess Pliny the Younger is Countess Beatrice. And the thing is that in the time of Henry the Third, now back to the Holy Roman Empire, he chased her husband uh, out. Her husband was a man named uh, Gottfried, I think. Um, he chased got, or, or rather, he chased Gottfried from Alsace to Tuscany, uh, from Alsace to Tuscany, where he then married Countess Beatrice. But Henry III was a very vindictive man. And once he, he focused on your ass, he never let go. So he came down again into Tuscany, specifically uh, after this guy. Um, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Steiner doesn't say. Uh, but then he kidnapped Beatrice uh, and took her back to Germany. Uh, but left the daughter there, Matilda of Tuscany, whom Countess Beatrice had been carefully um, teaching in court politics and, and how you hold court and what the formalities are. Um, so she was kind of a co-regent of their little area there in Tuscany that they owned. And they were cozy with Pope Gregory VII, whom, as we've seen, reincarnates later as Ernst Haeckel. So once again, we can see the brilliance of how Steiner tells this history and weaves it like a tapestry, all these different threads that he returns back to and weaves and back to and weaves. And you can kind of see one of the themes of this, as we said, was the penetration of Islam into the West on the astral plane. But another one of the themes is the incestuous nature of Europe with all these incarnations. They really do interweave, not just on the physical plane through the bloodlines, but also on the astral plane through these incarnations. Uh, so Matilda of Tuscany was very cozy with Pope Gregory the Seventh, uh, and they were against Henry the Fourth, who now. Uh, so now, when Pope Gregory the Seventh gets in as uh, as um, the Pope, um, he declaims uh, there's an issue over the issue of lay investiture because Henry the Third, when he had come in uh, with all the power of the Emperor and the weakness of the papacy, had said that. Um, the Germans could appoint churchmen to offices. This was called lay investiture. Now, Pope Gregory then pulls back, as we have seen, with the Dictatus Papi and says, no, the emperor su is subordinate to the pope, not, not the other way around. The pope has all the power. Um, and so, and the Roman population had declined, though, from about half a million people um, earlier to, like, in the time we're talking about here, the 11th century to about 20,000 people. So it had been quite thoroughly depopulated by this time. Um, and so Pope Gregory says, no, lay investiture. No, absolutely, you cannot do this. And so he excommunicates Henry IV um, and then tells his vassals that they don't have to obey him, which puts Henry IV in a very perilous situation of rebellion. So he has to meet with his vassals at the Diet of Augsburg, so they all meet, they sit down, meet, and they f form, n and they say, well, okay, we'll back you. But he's been excommunicated at this point. And so now he tries this political ploy of dressing himself like a sinner in a sackcloth with ashes. And he goes to the castle of Canassa, where Matilda of Tuscany is now ruling, and she is protecting Pope Gregory the Seventh there. He happens to be there 
in her castle at Canassa. And so Henry IV goes there at Christmas, uh, I think it's 1070, if I remember right, and he kneels, or it might be 1080 actually, and he, he kneels and he begs forgiveness for three days out in the cold, shivering in the snow. And Pope Gregory is in a difficult position because he knows he'll lose the support of the German nobility if he forgives him. Um, so he forgives him. But meanwhile, the German nobility have appointed Rudolf of Swabia to be uh, uh, the emperor. So then the, Henry IV goes back to Germany. And now this causes a civil war for three years. From 1077 to, to 1080, uh, there's a civil war. So this wasn't 1080. It, was, it must have been earlier uh, the, the, um, at, at Canassa. And so there's a civil war. They fight. And then, as we said before, um, Henry IV gets excommunicated again a second time. And uh, I forget the issue why, but he marches on Rome. He decides, no, um, you are not the legitimate pope. Um, they've appointed another pope. Uh, the emperor has, the, Henry IV, because Rudolf has died in battle. And so now he's got the support of the German nobility behind him, and he marches on Rome, goes in. Um, and as we said before, uh, um, the pope, the papal states invite the Normans in, and the Normans come in and fight on their side, and then they end up tearing Rome to pieces. But Henry IV essentially wins. Uh, he wins and he chases Pope Gregory out. So he's out of Rome and a year later he, he dies. So that's the story. So this is now Tacitus and Pliny reincarnated as mother and daughter. Um, and Tacitus, once again, Matilda is the more famous one. Um, the, the Tacitus line in individuality always seems to be the more famous one than, than Pliny the Younger and to have greater accomplishments. And so uh, Steiner points out, he, he says that um, whereas Tacitus had been an historian at recounting events, Matilda of Tuscany was an observer of events and a very good one, uh, an observer of all this political turmoil and chaos that was going on around them. Um, so then they reincarnate um, as... Um, Pliny the Younger then re let's see no let's let's start with Tacitus actually Tacitus then after the incarnation of Matilda of Tuscany whose dates are 1046 to 1115 for the record um, reincarnates as Hermann Grimm in the 19th century the son of one of the Grimm brothers uh, Wilhelm Grimm um, so the famous Grimm brothers so he's the son of one of them his dates are uh, 1828 to 1901, and he is an academic. He has inherited the academic writing style from uh, his father and uncle, um, but it's very uncomfortable. He doesn't like it. It doesn't really suit his character, um, so he's frustrated with, with the academic writing style, doesn't really want to write that way, um, so he's looking for another stylist after whom he can model his prose, and one day he happens to be in someone's house, and he sees a, co co a copy of Ralph Waldo Emerson's Representative Men. So he sees this on the table, and he picks it up, and he starts reading. And as everyone knows who's read Emerson, his prose is very lush and purple and romantic. And he reads it, and he goes, ah, this is how I want to be writing. So he changes his writing at that point uh, to model it off of Emerson's writings, and he writes, I don't think anything has been translated of Hermann Grimm. Uh, he writes, uh, Representative Men was published in 1850. And um, he's got a life of Michelangelo in 1865, a book on the Venus de Milo in 1864, it looks like, one on Albrecht Dürer, 1866, the destruction of Rome in 1886, and so forth. And so uh, if one were to read these, I suppose, Presumably, one would see the, the influence of the style of Emerson on him. And, of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson is none other than Tacitus. So Tacitus, via Matilda, has now reincarnated, after Matilda, has now reincarnated as Ralph Waldo Emerson, whom, once again, uh, Grimm admires, just as Pliny the Younger had admired Tacitus, so Hermann Grimm now admires Ralph Waldo Emerson's style and really wants to meet him. And at one point they, they do meet. 
Um, and Grimm really worshipped him. And uh, all right, so that's the story of those two individualities, uh, which is one of my favorites in Steiner's uh, book so far. I think it's fantastic. Uh, in the next lecture, by the way, uh, he will get into the past lives of both Ibsen and Holderlin. So we'll take a look at those next.